On April 15, 1912, the unthinkable happened. The largest state-of-the-art ocean liner ever built, designed to be unsinkable, sank. On its maiden voyage, the RMS Titanic sank in the North Atlantic Ocean, taking around three quarters of its passengers with it. The deadliest sinking of a cruise ship in peacetime has been immortalized in film for its grand scale tragedy. And with a little help from Celine Dion, also some romance. Yet the stories of the real life passengers are as remarkable as any fiction. Be they vilified business magnates, heirs to fortunes, pregnant mothers praying for escape, or those who couldn't be stopped, like the unsinkable Molly Brown. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we examine Titanic characters that really existed. Joseph Bruce Ismay is without a doubt one of the biggest painted villains of the RMS Titanic story. Ismay was the managing director and chairman of the British shipping company White Star Line. Operational from 1845 to 1934, White Star Line was a company with an entirely polar reputation. On one hand, a premier maritime shipping company providing comfort and speed traveling across the Atlantic, and on the other hand, infamous for losing grand vessels including SS Atlantic, RMS Atlantic, HMHS Britannic, and, you guessed it, the RMS Titanic. Ismay's villainous reputation is partly based on fact. He ordered the number of lifeboats provided on the Titanic to be the minimum of 16 instead of the standard 48. He would be on board for the Titanic's maiden voyage and would survive escaping on a lifeboat, 20 minutes before the vessel sank entirely. Ismay would be summoned before the U.S. Senate for inquiry hearings while vilified in the press as J. Brute Ismay. While some would testify that Ismay had only taken a place on the lifeboat after loading women and children first, his wife, Lucille Carter, would testify otherwise. After the two filed for divorce in 1914, Ismay would return to London after the hearings reviled in the U.S. press and detested for cowardice by London circles. John Jacob Astor IV was one of the RMS Titanic's high society passengers and, at the time, one of the most famous businessmen in the world. John Jacob had been born into one of the richest families in the West, the Astor family, which had made a fortune in real estate in New York and the United Kingdom. While he would patent a handful of inventions and pen his own book, a sci-fi novel for 1894 set in the year 2000, ow, out there, man, John Jacob's main contribution to family wealth would be a hotel. In 1897, he would build and founded the Astoria Hotel, which would conveniently neighbor his cousin William Waldorf's own hotel. So it's thanks to these two magnate juniors that we have the Waldorf Astoria today. By far, John Jacob Astor IV was the wealthiest passenger aboard the RMS Titanic. Astor would die in the sinking of the unsinkable ship and do so with a net wealth of around $2.4 billion in today's money. The world had lost one of its very richest, and the U.S. Senate hearings into what went wrong on the maiden voyage, ironically, would be hosted at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Madeline Force's story is one of many harsh tales to come from the tragedy that befell the RMS Titanic. In 1911, she would marry John Jacob Astor IV, despite what was felt by many as a controversial age gap of 29 years between the two. Starting the following year, the couple began an extensive honeymoon, and wouldn't you know it, they booked seats on the Titanic as part of their romantic getaway. Oh boy. As can be seen depicted in the movie when Madeline boarded the Titanic in France with her husband, she was five months pregnant. Barely two days into the Titanic's voyage, it would hit an iceberg, and initially, like many, Madeline was assured the damage was nothing to be worried about. John Jacob Astor had strapped a life jacket onto his wife and taken concern for her condition, yet the situation rapidly unraveled. When it came time for the pregnant 18-year-old to board a lifeboat, she had to crawl through a promenade window and into a dangerously tilting lifeboat. Madeline got aboard, with a nurse and a maid no less, but her husband Jacob could not board with her. He inquired what number the lifeboat was so he could find her afterward. However, Jacob would die in the sinking, and this would be the last time the two would ever see each other. Some four months later, on August 14, 1912, Madeline would give birth to their child, John Jacob VI. The child was left a fortune but he would be fatherless and his mother forever be a widowed figure in the public imagination. <music> Bill Gates' 
Benjamin Guggenheim marks another tragedy from the Titanic sinking that would mark American high society. Born into wealth like many of his ilk, Benjamin was one of the seven sons of Meyer Guggenheim, a highly successful mining magnate. His marriage to Florette Seligman in 1894 would produce three children, including one Peggy Guggenheim, the name and founder of the famous 20th century art collection. But in 1912, Benjamin was no family man and not particularly interested in his wife, either. He boarded the Titanic with his mistress, Leontine Aubard. It's alleged that Benjamin slept through the Titanic's collision with the iceberg. When woken to be informed, he just dismissed it and had to be convinced to put on a life jacket and get prepared. Yet the gravity of the situation, or for that matter, just gravity itself, soon arrived for Benjamin. His mistress, Leontine, and her maid were soon up on the boat deck. As they boarded a lifeboat, Benjamin reportedly told them in German it would all work out and that the Titanic would be repaired by the morrow. Yet he knew otherwise. Both he and his valet returned to their cabin after sending the women off to put on their Sunday best. Before he went down with the vessel to his death, Benjamin Guggenheim is written in survivors' accounts to have said, We've dressed up in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. Edward John Smith would be a man to go down with his ship as a respected British naval officer and captain of the RMS Titanic. After 47 years of active service, around 30 of which were in command of vessels as large as flagships, Captain Smith had never seen disaster. Despite becoming an embodiment of the stiff upper lip for going down with his ship, there are varied accounts of what Smith actually did that night when disaster struck. Some accounts credit Smith as a presence calming the panic and assisting as many passengers with evacuation as possible. Others depict Smith as a man frozen in panic and a curse upon any evacuation attempt. It's argued that Captain Smith knew full well there wouldn't be enough lifeboats, but didn't tell a single crew member. There are conflicting accounts as to whether the captain even looked to see if his evacuation orders were being followed through. No matter the conduct of Captain Smith on that fateful night, all accounts attribute him as last sighted on the Titanic's bridge, a captain who went down with his ship. Thomas Andrews was a sterling example of heroism aboard the Titanic and likely one of the proudest people on the ship. I mean, he built it. The British businessman ran Harlan & Wolf, a shipbuilding company in Ireland, and as a respected naval architect, was given the reins to design the RMS Titanic. Some would argue to this day, Andrews was an advocate for the maximum allowance of lifeboats 48. He's also believed to have desired a double hull for the vessel. His recommendations were not taken in for the final construction. It's hard to know how much Andrews would have pondered this the night iceberg struck, but by all accounts, he was quick to act and unyieldingly brave. As you may well have seen in the movie, the reflection of Thomas Andrews' bravery is not inaccurate. Survivors speak of sighting Andrews on more than one occasion, urging any passengers he encountered towards lifeboats. In the heightened panic of evacuation, Andrews only showed concerns for others, searching staterooms and giving out life belts. He would die when the ship sank and was survived by his wife of four years, Helen, and their two-year-old daughter, Elba. Wallace Henry Hartley presents one of the tragedy's clearest examples of duty ever brought to greater light. He is a name you may not know, but without a doubt, if you've seen a certain film, I have a sinking feeling you'd know who's being spoken about. Before the Titanic's voyage, Hartley was building a reputation as a musician hired on cruise liners by music agency CW and FN Black, namely the White Star Line. In a turn of fate, Hartley had just made Maria Robinson his fiancée when the call came for him to be a bandmaster of the RMS Titanic. He was torn, but he was convinced the voyage of such a publicized vessel would only secure further gigs as a musician. Oh, fate, how cruel you can be. I'm sure you know the famous scene, the Titanic has been struck, crowds fill the decks waiting for evacuation, and an orchestral band for the maiden voyage starts playing to calm the panicked passengers. An act of beauty as much as duty, a bit of storytelling liberty, a sprinkle of Hollywood magic to pull the heartstrings? No, not at all. Wallace Henry Hartley led his seven other band members on violin, and they played minute by minute as the boat sunk lower and lower into the water, if you'll take a survivor's word for it. All eight of the band members would lose their lives as the ship was lost to the sea. Yet their heroism wasn't lost in history. Hartley himself would have a bust erected in his honor, and the violin that led these brave musicians' last dance, fetching $1.7 million an entire century later. Mm -hmm. 
Margaret Brown, memorably depicted in the 1997 film by Kathy Bates, would be a survivor who would come to public prominence for her heroism. In the public's mind, she would be known as the unsinkable Molly Brown. Prior to joining the maiden voyage, Margaret Brown was an American socialite who would marry Joseph James Brown, far from a socialite himself. However, the tale of true love paid off as the lowly J.J. Brown would find success in ore mining, opening up the couple to a fortune. The two privately separated in 1909, but Molly Brown would continue a rich vein of philanthropic work with her fortune. Margaret would board the Titanic on April 10, 1912 in Southampton, England, to join up with the John Jacob Astor IV party, though she really set sail for New York to visit an ill relative. However, it would take a tragedy to strike for the world to learn of her remarkable character. Following the iceberg collision and the lowering of the limited lifeboats, the boat deck filled and panic set in. Not for Molly Brown. She was nothing short of a force, assuring as many people boarded the boats available as possible. In the nightmarish scenario of the unsinkable ship sinking, Molly Brown led the charge to save lives. So consumed was she, Brown had to be convinced to board a lifeboat of her own. Even when evacuating on her lifeboat, Molly Brown, with an oar in hand, lobbied that the lifeboat turn back to save as many as they possibly could. When the quartermaster forbade it for fear the lifeboat would be brought down with the Titanic from the suction, Molly Brown threatened to throw the quartermaster overboard. Following her rescue, Molly Brown would set up a survivors committee with other wealthy survivors. Through her drive, the committee was able to assure necessities for any survivors of the horrific capsizing, including the rare feat for the time of counseling. The unsinkable Molly Brown, an example to us all, when wealth and riches pale in comparison to humanism and humility. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.